people don't realize that you can consume carbohydrates without gaining body fat if you are selecting the appropriate portions for your goals and you understand the differences between the dietary sources of carbohydrates. <music> Hey, what's up YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. It's Christine with Gage Girl Training. I'm a food scientist and chemical engineer, and in today's video, we're going to talk about carb confusion. So let's get started. Unfortunately, carbohydrates are the most misunderstood food group when it comes to proper nutrition. Now this class of nutrients causes confusion due to a fundamental misunderstanding of how the body processes them, what foods contain carbs, as well as how many carbs you should be consuming for your health goals. I literally cringe when I hear people say, carbs are bad. And the reason for that is because we need to look at things from the perspective of how the ingredient will be utilized on a biochemical level and what form that is going to be delivered to the body. Once you understand those two things, it's actually extremely simple. And in today's video, I'm going to break that down for you. Glucose is a sugar molecule and it is the simplest form of a carbohydrate which is created from an endothermic condensation reaction between carbon dioxide and water. As a molecule, carbs consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. As you can see in this equation, we have carbohydrates as the result of CO2 plus water and energy coming together and it's yielding a unit of glucose plus oxygen. The term now the reason this is important for you guys to understand is because when a carbohydrate is consumed, it is going to ultimately break into the glucose molecule. And when that's consumed, it is going to be broken down in the small intestine into smaller building blocks as glucose so that the cells can use it as energy. Your body is going to kick into action once the glucose moves from your small intestines and into the bloodstream. And a healthy level of sugar in the blood is approximately at 80 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. This is the equivalent of approximately one teaspoon of sugar per five liters of blood. So visually imagine a teaspoon of sugar per five liters of blood. Now your body is going to kick into action once the glucose moves from your small intestines and into the bloodstream. This is where it all starts to break down. Now, insulin is a messenger hormone. It is created in the pancreas. Its job is to take the sugar out of your blood and to transfer it inside of your cells where it can be used as energy. And the body relies on dietary sources of carbohydrates as its energy source, just the same way that cars rely on gasoline. The problem is that if energy is not being expended by the body, you're consuming carbs that your body just doesn't need. So imagine if you keep putting gas into a car that's never driving or never moving or never going anywhere, where is that gasoline gonna go? Especially if the tank is going to is already full. That gasoline is just going to spill out and accumulate. So imagine a person eating carbs, you're not moving, you're not going anywhere. If your energy expenditure as a person is very low, those carbs have nowhere to go but to be stored as future energy that your body will need. So because of this, this is where carbs tend to get a bad reputation because people think, okay, well, if I'm not working out a lot or if I want to lose weight, I need to eat less carbs. But the reality is people don't realize that you can consume carbohydrates without gaining body fat if you are selecting the appropriate portions for your goals and you understand the differences between the dietary sources of carbohydrates. Now, dietary sources of carbohydrates consist of starches, sugars, fiber, and sugar alcohols. There are actually four. And these are naturally found in grains, they are found in fruit, they are also found in vegetables. And most people are surprised to learn that fruit and vegetables are carbs because these ingredients are generally perceived as good, whereas things like 
starchy carbs like bread and pasta are generally perceived as bad. I'm going to talk about the differences between the four types of carbohydrates and we're first going to talk about starches. Starches are also known as soluble fiber. Now eliminating starches is very popular with fad diets and whenever you are consuming the appropriate portions for your goals they are a crucial component of a well-rounded diet and starchy carbs are not bad. They are naturally found in a variety of real whole foods from everything from grains, legumes, vegetables, and they are composed entirely of glucose molecules arranged into long complex chains. Now there are two main categories of starches that most people don't realize. They are amylose, which consists of a straight single chain like structure as well as amylopectin, which forms a disordered mass with chemically similar but shorter chains. It's important to understand that there is a difference between the chemical structure of starches is because it's going to impact the rate at which it breaks down in your body. So for instance, if you're looking here at the difference between amylose and amylopectin, a linear starch like amylose is actually going to break down at a slower rate compared to a branched starch like amylopectin due to the differences in the surface area. So amylose is a type of starch that is resistant to digestion in the gut. That's very important to know. Instead, it's broken down by fermentation of bacteria in the gut. And while there are different varieties of amylose, the key thing that you need to remember about amylose is that it's an indigestible starch that won't result in sharp increases in your blood sugar. Examples of foods that are high in amylose include whole grains, legumes, starchy fruit and some veggies. There are specific foods that ha once they have been cooked and then cooled will have more of this type of behavior. But in contrast to starches that have the structure of amylopectin, which is their very branched high surface area structure, amylopectin based carbs are going to increase your insulin levels much faster because which it, again, insulin is the messenger hormone and that's going to release from the pancreas to help lower your blood sugar. Now, when insulin levels are high, the pancreas is going to be unable to release fat burning hormones. So if you are consuming foods that are high in amylopectin, it's going to lead to an increase in stored body fat. So specifically, examples of high amylopectin foods include crackers, bagels, oats, pretzels, potato chips, white bread, cereal. While it's not practical for me to review the chemical structure of every single carb you consume, this is why the glycemic index scale was created for you guys, because it allows us to rank the carbs based off of the rate at which it causes your blood sugar to spike. So it's really crucial to understand that that's what the glycemic index chart and ranking system is about because if I drew out every single carb structure for you and, it, and said it breaks down into your body at this rate, that's not going to mean anything. You need to know relative to each other how fast they cause your blood sugar to spike. So that's the underlying motivation for the GI, the glycemic index ranking system because you're essentially understanding the difference between starches that have a more amylose type structure versus an amylopectin style structure. Now, if something had a rating of 100 on the glycemic index scale, that means that is the absorption of pure sugar in your blood. Zero would be something that has no impact and will have no rise on your blood sugar as a result of consuming it. Now, something having a high glycemic index value is not bad. It's not bad because if you're an athlete, you're gonna wanna consume something that will give you a sharp spike in your blood sugar, whereas maybe if you're a diabetic or if you have um, insulin resistance, you're probably gonna want something that is within a certain range. The last thing I'm gonna say about the glycemic index before I move on to the other types of carbs is that the glycemic index does not account for the effect of a mixture of foods within a given meal. So let's say you're eating some white rice, which is a high GI food. However, but if you prepare that fried rice with some veggies and some proteins, the rate at which it's going to affect your blood sugar is going to be slower because you have a combination effect of it with other foods in your system. So including lower GI foods with a higher GI food is actually advantageous because it's gonna help slow down blood sugar spikes. The next type of carb we're gonna talk about is insoluble fiber. Now you've probably heard that fiber is good for you and that most people need more fiber and that 
than they're currently getting. Now, fiber is a type of carbohydrate that is naturally found in plants. It is characterized by its resistance to digestion once it is consumed. So unlike the simple sugar chemical structure of the glucose molecule, table sugar, where it's only one unit, fiber is made up of many units. And what ends up happening is that can't be broken down for digestion. If something cannot be digested, it cannot be used for energy. And this is what distinguishes insoluble fiber, which is vegetables, from soluble fiber, which is starches. Now again, insoluble fiber slows down the rate at which food enters the bloodstream. It's going to increase the rate at which food exits the digestive tract. And the reason is because it's gonna push right through your small intestines because it's not going to be absorbed in the blood. So it's going to increase the rate at which essentially you go to the bathroom. And unlike soluble fiber, insoluble fiber does not dissolve in water. So it's commonly known for its ability to support regular bowel movement. It adds bulk to one's stools. It also prevents constipation. So this is very important to understand. And this enables a stable blood sugar. It enables a healthy cholesterol level. And if one eats this way on a regular basis as a healthy lifestyle, it is significantly easier for somebody to drop body fat and sustain a healthy weight. And the reason is that insoluble fiber is naturally found in wheat bran, it's naturally found in vegetables, it's naturally found in whole grains, and most people do not get enough fiber in their diet. Again, this is a carb, but it's not bad. The average American only gets 10 grams of fiber per day when they, in fact they need about double that for women, almost triple that for men. And a common mistake that most people will do is that they're gonna take so much more fiber all at once resulting in painful constipation, which is something you do not want to do. In fact, if you are under eating your fiber, you most likely want to give yourself about a week to acclimate to a higher fiber meal plan by, by adding approximately an extra five grams of fiber per day so to, to work your way up there. Now from a macro perspective, a lot of people end up subtracting fiber from the total carbs resulting in a value called net carbs because this is not converted into energy in the body and that's perfectly acceptable and suitable to do. So the next type of carb we're going to talk about is sugar. Now sugar is the fundamental glucose molecule and primary fuel source for all human function. And when no carbohydrates are consumed, the body is going to break everything down into this simple molecule. So here's the problem. The problem is that if there is no immediate energy need or energy demand on your body, if your body just does not have anything to do with itself, glucose is going to be stored as glycogen. Glycogen is stored in the muscle cells as well as the liver, but our body has a limited capacity for how much glycogen it could store. So in the muscle cells, the average person can store anywhere between four and 500 grams. Let's say the liver may be another 100 grams, the blood can hold a very, very tiny bit, but once your glycogen stores are full and there's no more room, any excess carbohydrates will be stored as fat. So this is why you need to understand your body, you need to understand the capacity of how many carbs your body can tolerate in order to make sure that you can eat carbs and enjoy them and use them for the benefits that they were intended for. So carbs inherently are not bad. I think people just do not understand the capacity and limits that their body has for them relative to how much energy expenditure they're practically doing. The problem with sugar is that it comes in various forms. And when people think sugar, they literally think of like table sugar in like a dish with a spoon or like big cubes that you would have like at tea time or something. But the reality is that Sugar is a natural ingredient. It's found in fruit, vegetables, and even dairy-based foods. And various forms of sugar are not always sweet to the taste, and therefore there's a lot of surprising foods that actually contain sugar that you would never actually think are loaded with this ingredient. Some examples are things like salad dressings, ketchup, yogurt, granola, protein powders, nut butter, and sports drinks. And the average person used to only consume 15 grams of sugar per day. And they, it used to be from real whole foods. But the problem is with the industrialization of sugar over the last century, there's widespread usage of sugar in processed foods all over the place where there has been a 5X increase, 5X increase in the amount of sugar that people consume per day is the fact that people are no longer getting sugar from real whole food sources and they're getting it 
in isolated sources that have been chemically modified. And that's a problem because real whole foods do contain vital nutrients, fiber, and antioxidants. Now, I have to tell you guys that as a chemical engineer, I can definitely appreciate the benefits of the industrialization of foods because it has enabled worldwide transport, it has allowed food sources to be more convenient, supply chain logistics, longer shelf life of packaged foods, it actually allows consumers to have lower cost foods, but the problem is that the end users of these foods are not consciously aware of the sheer volume of isolated sugar that they are actually consuming. And that is the reason why there is so much carbohydrate confusion. Sugar-rich processed foods are extremely calorically dense. They have no fiber in them. And it's very easy to overeat these types of foods because they are not filling and they can actually make you feel hungrier as a result of consuming them. So that leads us to insulin resistance, which is a whole nother topic. I have an entire video on that, but for the sake of this video to keep it moving, I'm going to touch on the last part, which is sugar alcohols. Now, sugar alcohols confuses people a lot. I get a question all the time, and unfortunately their name is a little bit misleading because they are not sugar molecules and they are not alcohols. This is a class of carbs. It's also referred to as polyols, and it's popping up a lot more in the last decade due to the popularity of low-carb nutrition protocols. Now, the structure combines the properties of an alcohol chemical structure as well as chemical properties of sugar molecules, hence the hybrid name. However, the cla this class of ingredients has a similar flavor to conventional table sugar with fewer calories because they are not fully digested in the gut. Now the problem is this is not entirely accurate. I'm going to do an entire separate video dedicated to sugar alcohols to allow you guys to understand how they are broken down in the body in more detail, how to handle them from a carb counting perspective because they are only partially digested. Some sugar alcohols can be completely subtracted from your total carbs, while some only a fraction of them can. So I'll give I'll go into a lot of detail from that in a in a future video. But the thing is you guys when it comes to figuring out how many carbs you actually need, it's gonna depend on your goal. It's gonna depend on your preferred eating style. But I want you guys to realize that there are several other factors and that carbs are way more complex then you realize it's not enough to just say carbs are bad because they're not. It's all about the context. Context matters. So if you want a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me or a member of my team to discuss how many carbs are right for you, if you should be on a high carb diet, a low carb diet, what if you're trying to gain muscle, what if you're trying to lose fat, what if your body doesn't process carbs, sign up for a one-on-one -on -one consultation. I'll be happy to walk you through these, even recommend what specific types of carbs you should be consuming for your needs and for your body type because it does make a huge difference guys. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.